Welcome to In the Green Chair, an interview series by Relay Education. In each episode, we sit down with a professional who's working the green economy to learn about their story. I'm your host, Ade, and today I'm joined with my co-host, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Ade. My name is Andrew. I'm the Green Careers Officer at Relay Education. Relay is a Canadian charity that delivers renewable energy and environmental education programs with the goal of creating change for a greener future and fostering the next generation of green leaders. This interview series is part of the Green Collar Careers Program, which offers opportunities for youth to explore and build careers to help protect the good green earth. Throughout the series, you'll hear from professionals across a wide range of fields and sectors who all work in what we consider to be a green collar career. Today's guest in the green chair is Mike Schreiner. Hi, Mike. Welcome to our show. Hi, Day, Andrew. Nice to be here with you and uh, looking forward to being in the green chair. Yes, thank you. So not only are you the leader of the Green Party of Ontario, but in 2018, you became the first member of provincial parliament from your party in the Ontario Legislative Assembly. So can you tell us more about your role and who you are? Yeah, well, I'm the MPP for Guelph and the leader of the Green Party. And I guess first and foremost, I'm a, I'm a husband and a father, and uh, a, as well as an MPP. And I, I love this job. I love being a representative for my constituents from Guelph and really, you know, working hard to serve them. And I love being the leader of the Green Party of Ontario and being the green voice in the legislature for people all across the province. And, uh, you know, I'm always balancing my role of uh, being an advocate in the legislature for the Green Party with my role of being an MPP who's there to serve everybody in Guelph, whether they voted for me or not, or agree with the Green Party or not. And so I work hard to do both. And right now, I think my big push is making sure that we address the public health challenges around COVID-19, obviously, and that we look at uh, uh, investing in a green and caring recovery as we come out of the pandemic. That's something that I, I really want to know more about because, you know, you're you're working. I want to know what it's like to work in the Ontario Legislative Building and and get these really important um, initiatives like passed and rolling. So I know your office is uh, based in Guelph, but when it's time to like pass bills and bring issues to the forefront, um, the MPPs from all over Ontario meet in Toronto. And I wanna know how often that happens and what a typical day is like in Queens Park, especially now because of COVID, are, are things happening over Zoom? Like how does that work? Yeah, so a little bit of both. So I'm in my Queens Park office right now. So uh, this is what a bit of what Queens Park looks like. And we're, we generally meet uh, September to December and February through June. And we meet in Queens Park Monday to Thursday every week. And then I'm back in my riding in Guelph Friday, Saturday, and Sunday generally. And, and uh, you know, it's an interesting time to be here because each party is limited the number of MPPs they bring into the building, the number of staff we bring into the building. And so normally I'd have lots of meetings with various stakeholder groups, constituency groups, advocacy organizations in my office a lot. Uh, we'd have a lot of morning, afternoon and evening kind of receptions and giving speeches at different um, events hosted by various organizations rallies and protests out in front of Queens Park we'd be asked to go speak at, as well as the work we do in the house itself, where we have question period, which is something you know you may see on the news, or when we're debating bills that are before uh, provincial parliament. A lot of that has changed now uh, because of COVID. And so we're really kind of here with a limited staff. We spend time in the house for question period and debate, and then we're out of here. Most of the committee meetings are, are done over Zoom now. So it's been, it's been a big shift, quite frankly. It's really assuring to know that you all have a, a game plan, that you're staying safe, that we know that you're all in good health and that you're still, you're still um, you're focused on the goals and you're still meeting and you're still talking. It's important, it really is. And uh, you know, throughout the pandemic, we've continued to meet. 
uh, but we've really made sure we we're doing it in a way that complies with public health guidelines. Are there any challenges of being the only member of your party as an MPP? One of the biggest challenges I've faced is the Ford government almost from day one was really focused on dismantling a lot of uh, environmental policies in Ontario. I mean, their very first bill was about dismantling the province's climate action plan, canceling 750 renewable energy projects. Uh, they've rolled back the environmental assessment process, gutted the Endangered Species Act. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. And so oftentimes, I feel like I'm just fighting almost a, in, in a defensive mode. We have had some success. There are a few things that the government was going to do, such as allowing development in the green belt and source water protection regions that we were able to stop. Uh, and that's because people across the province got politically active. So they held rallies, signed petitions, got their municipal councils to say, hey, Queens Park, don't do that. And so that on the ground grassroots uh, activism uh, helped somebody like me then uh, bring that voice to Queens Park, amplify that voice at Queens Park and put pressure on the government. The things that you do with your neighbors on a community level or in, in your hometowns or cities, those do make a difference at the end of the day. They do um, help, help push the needle a little bit. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think a lot of politicians respond to the pressure they're feeling in their community. And so when you work with your neighbors and community organizations or an environmental NGO or a neighborhood association, uh, when you come together and organize campaigns uh, that put pressure on politicians, uh, those politicians are forced to respond. And they may not always respond in the way you want, uh, but you know what, if, you, if you're not out there, uh, you know, raising the concerns that you have and making sure your voice is heard, then, then, your, then the politicians won't hear it and they won't act on it. Perhaps people think that the grassroots movement is different than politics, mm. right? And it, there's a symbiotic relationship that benefits you when we get active in our community, but you're also opening our eyes to um, the collaboration that's possible. If you could find someone else in Queens Park who maybe is from a different party, but has some uh, shared value in terms of like electric vehicles, you can make things happen through collaboration. You know, I, absolutely. I mean, I think the only way we're going to get the enduring transformative change we need is to make sure there's a broad spectrum of people in our society who are behind the actions you're, you're taking. I'd like to know a little bit about um yourself and, and some of the influences that uh, made you decide to become a, an advocate for the environment? The moment that I remember the most in terms of me being engaged more politically on environmental issues was when I was in, the, in university. And so for some of your folks probably don't remember 1992, but the um, Rio uh, Earth Summit. And I just remember it, it, it not producing the kinds of positive results that I wanted to see. And I was a university student at the time, and I thought, you know, I just have to get politically engaged on environmental issues. Uh, but I think those uh, ethics and values come from my, my childhood. I grew up on a farm, and, and we had a creek that went through the farm, and I just spent so much time in nature. It also informs the work I do around social and racial justice as well. Um, I don't think, you know, we're not gonna save the planet if we don't care for and, and protect and serve each other. And I encourage all your viewers and listeners to, to get involved in politics. And you can get involved in politics in a variety of ways. So, you know, I, I started a, a local organic food business way back in the 1990s. And as, an, as a way to, you know, transform our food system and to make it more environmentally sustainable. And I would argue that's politics. Like it's not formal politics running for office and being elected, but I think starting businesses, starting nonprofit organizations, starting social enterprises that, that advance an environmental agenda is just as important as the political work that I do. I, I'd like to know what, what were those, uh, those businesses that you did um, before your, your career as a politician? Yeah, so I, I started one of Ontario's first uh, local organic food delivery companies. 
uh, on a farm just outside of uh, Guelph, Ontario. And then I started a second business with my business owner, business partners um, called Earth Dance Organics that uh, made organic fruit pies and um, prepared meals for people. I did that for around 10 years or so. Um, and then I left the business to start a, to help start with a, with a friend of mine, uh, a nonprofit organization promoting local food and farmers. And I did, I've done that work for quite a while. The transition into being uh, a part of a nonprofit organization, um, promoting uh, both food policy change and marketing and supply chain changes really led me back into politics. Like I had always been interested in politics. How does climate change education play a part in uh, all of us working towards a greener future? Yeah, so I think the education work you're doing is essential and vital. And so thank you for doing that work. It, it is so important. And, and especially uh, around renewable energy. Uh, I mean, renewable energy is, is vital to addressing the climate crisis. It's a matter of one, educating people around um, the fact that renewable energy works, that um, there are ways that even if it, the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow and you know the river doesn't always flow for water power, um, there are ways to address that through smart grid technologies and battery storage, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a great opportunity for um, young people in particular, just in terms of career opportunities. Uh, you know, it's, it's a big job creator. And so, you know, it's a really practical way that somebody can earn a good living doing meaningful work that they care about and make a real difference in addressing the climate crisis. You know, we're not 100% renewable yet, so there's still a lot of opportunity to, to get there and, and all the jobs that go along with that. Yes, absolutely. During COVID, you have really um, pushed for that because you um, recently tabled a motion, I believe it's motion 107. It's about uh, retrofitting buildings to be more energy efficient, providing training and green jobs as part of Ontario's COVID-19 recovery plan. Um, and for the youth that are listening, how can youth employment benefit from this motion? So to me, it's a win for creating jobs for young people, especially who wanna uh, move into, into the trades, but also renewable energy. Uh, it's a win for our economy because we need to create jobs right now to get us out of this COVID recession. And it's a win for the environment because you know, we will reduce climate pollution and it's a win for businesses, homeowners and our public institutions because our utility bills will go down. A program like that really creates uh, gateways of opportunity uh, for, for young people to, to be in the buildings, trade, construction, um, renewable energy sectors. Um, do you know the process or the timeline or how this can be implemented? I, I have one or two what's called ballot days to decide uh, what will be debated that day. So about once a year, once every year and a half or so, I'm the one who gets to determine what gets debated and possibly passed. My next ballot date is coming up. It's the end of October. And I have two, two um, one bill and one motion on the order paper. I'm debating whether I'll call, what's, what's known as call that day. So I'll call it for debate. So my bill is to end uh, the practice of mandatory sick notes uh, for people who, um, you know, like their employer would require them to have a sick note to not come into work, or my green, or my, uh, green building retrofits motion. The motion is non-binding, so it's really calling on the government to do something. So then I would have to work with the government on delivering that. The bill is binding. Um, and, and it would have to pass second reading, which is what the vote that what will happen in October. And then it goes to committee and then it would come out of committee for what's called third reading debate. And if it's passed at that point, then it becomes law. As an MPP for Guelph, what do you do to ensure that youth voices are heard? Yeah. So the first thing I have is I have a youth council. It's primarily high school students. Uh, there are some University of Guelph students on the council as well. And so they directly advise me on issues that, you know, we're talking about at Queens Park. 
Uh, and then it, also at the end of the year, they give me a presentation on a bill or a motion they would like me to present to Queens Park and why. Well, I have young people who uh, run petition campaigns and I'll read their petition into the legislature at Queens Park. So they do the work and then they get to see, see me actually table the, their petition. My own personal follow-up question, but is it uh, refreshing to talk to young people? Uh, in I those love situations? it. <laughs> I love speaking with young people. So uh, I'm always, always happy to meet with young people. And uh, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, they can't vote. And I'm like, well, first of all, I don't care because I represent everybody in my writing, whether they vote for me or not. Uh, but, but they are future voters and they can influence how their parents vote anyway. But, uh, but I just, I find I'm really energized and motivated whenever I meet with young people. And, and I also, uh, you know, a lot of the work I do is really about how do we ensure we have a livable future Absolutely. And um, for all the youth watching right now, where can we find you on social media or the internet? Yeah, so uh, you can find me on like Facebook and Twitter, just my name, Mike Schreiner. On Instagram, I think it's Mike Schreiner GPO. Uh, you can also reach out to my office, um, mschreiner at ola.org or you know, Google me and you'll get my phone number, email, like all the contact information. Okay. I'm so glad uh, we had the opportunity to speak with you, Mike. And thank you so much for being here with us. Yeah, it was a real pl pleasure, real honor. And uh, everything I've heard about what uh, Relay does is, is fantastic. We hope you enjoyed learning about the different paths people take to working in the green economy. My name is Andrew. And I'm your host, Ade. Follow us on social media at Relay Education and check out our website, relayeducation.com, to learn more.